Welcome back, everyone. My name is Sam. And I'm Melissa. I grew up in the FLDS community. It is a polygamous group run by Warren Jeffs, and I moved out when I was 18 years old. I was raised LDS. Sam and I have been married for nine years and have two awesome kiddos. Yes, we do. If you're interested in just listening in today, we do have our podcast available, and please don't forget to like and subscribe. Also, if you're from a polygamous background and would like to share your story with the world, please feel free to reach out at growingupinpolygamy at gmail.com. We also have our holiday fundraiser going on right now where we're adopting a room at the Short Creek Dream Center. Thank yes. you so much to all of those who have donated. We have surpassed our goal, and we are excited if any of you feel so inclined to continue to donate. The more money that we raise, the more we can do in that room or possibly adopt a larger room. Yeah. We're really excited to see how much we can raise, how much we can put to this awesome organization. Yes, we're so excited to take you guys along with us in this journey and hopefully we can get some footage of us uh, doing that and uh, looking forward to sharing that with you. So thank you all so much for your support. Yes, today, okay, so we have been responding and reacting to every one of Peter Santanello's videos um, in his Mormonism series, and then obviously he did a video with us. If you have not seen it, we'll leave the link down below for you. Yeah. But when it came to getting to the point of our video, we just thought, well, we'll obviously just skip our video and move to the next video that Peter's done. Yeah, we weren't really going to do this. We thought, what? what's the point, right? But I guess you could say Peter almost convinced us that it would be a good idea to do this. And, you know, and so it's something that we thought, why not? Well, let's just see what happens. Uh, worst comes to worst, it doesn't work out. But uh, maybe there's some insight we can add to behind the scenes and also maybe some more information about things we talked about. Yeah, we kind of agreed with Peter. We were talking with him and he's like, well, it can either go really good or it can go really bad and be really boring. <laughs> so we're going to hope that it goes really well. Um, again, this... Shooting with Peter, we were with him for what six, seven hours. Like a it was a time. for a long time, yeah. right? And obviously, he has to cut it down for his channel. And so, more than anything, we thought it'd be kind of fun to come in here and maybe add a couple bits of what it was like shooting with Peter, uh, some behind the scenes things that maybe didn't be weren't able to make it the cut in his video that we can kind of share some insights that way. So hopefully for better or worse, um, yeah. I've never seen anyone react to their own video before or a video that they were in before, but we're going to try breaking it. breaking new YouTube ground here, <laughs> trying to react to ourselves. So there, there's these people on YouTube, Sam and Melissa, and we're going to react <laughs> to these crazy ideas that they have. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll see if we like them at all. Yeah. We'll see. Weird coming back. It's weird coming back. Oh, man. Just the memories, right? There's so many. So right here in this little lot where now there is a house, there was a double wide trailer home that we lived in as kids. That's where I was raised. A lot of my older siblings were raised here as well. So just while we have this picture here really quick, so to the left, you see right behind me, we had a big garden back there. We always had a lot of chores and things as kids to, uh, working in the garden. And then behind these big trees, you see the mountains behind there. That was my backyard growing up. That mountain right there that you see, we would build rock forts. We were always up in those mountains. If we could ever sneak away from chores and things, <laughs> we'd be up in those mountains playing. And we had neighbors right behind our house here that we would sometimes get into mischief with as well. But yes, this home you see here, this, this is fairly new and it replaced the double wide trailer, like I said. So with the big family that I grew up in, in a double wide trailer, that was quite the unique experience. It, I didn't know any different, so it didn't, it wasn't a bad experience in any way, at least I didn't think it was, but it was interesting to be so close to so many people all the time. You know, talk about living in everyone else's space. Yeah, no personal space, that's for right, sure. Right, right. So anyway, just wanted to point that out. Even during that time in such a small area, there were, I mean, we had probably about 15, 16 kids living there Double at once. Wide. How many mothers did you have? So originally when I was born, there were three, three moms in the house. My mom was the second wife. That's a whole interesting story about how, you know, the wives got along and all of that. But my mom was the second and I am about the middle child of hers. She had 12 kids and I have 36 siblings altogether. Wow. So big family. A different family owned this home, but the, the dad had passed away. In typical FLDS fashion, they just juggled everything around. They moved the family away, said, okay, now you guys need to move somewhere else. And they moved us across the street and we said, okay. And so we just grabbed our things, came across here. And this, is, uh, this, was, this was my childhood home right here. 
Okay, so this woman here, FLDS or hard to tell? Do you know? <laughs> My guess would be an ex-FLDS member, yeah. Ex-FLDS. Ex-FLDS. Okay. Or someone from over the hill. A couple things give it away. She's wearing red. Red's a big no-no in the FLDS community. Could not wear red, not even, a t not even a tie, let alone a skirt. Just because it gets attention? Yeah, well, okay. not, it was religious. So Warren Jeffs, the prophet of the FLDS, told us that red was not allowed because it was a reserved color for the return of Jesus Christ, that he was going to return in a red robe. And it was sacred, no one could wear it. So what percentage is FLDS here now, or fundamentalists, would you say? Okay, so fundamentalists, there's still quite a few. I would say, okay. I would say probably 80% are still fundamentalists. In town? In town. But, but a lot of them, I would say the majority, maybe 90% of those people no longer, believe, no longer believe in Warren Jeffs. Okay. So and we've talked about this before on our channel, but there's still like 30 to 40,000 polygamists in Utah. And now Warren Jeffs group is very small compared and to the amount of compared, polygamists. Right. And that's just polygamists, let alone fundamentalists that maybe aren't practicing plural marriage or believe in the principle of it, but aren't doing it themselves. So when they're t when we talk about fundamentalists, we're talking about people who believe in the fundamental teachings of the LDS prophets. So like Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, John Taylor, and there are a lot of people who believe in those fundamentals and it tends to end up with believing in polygamy mm -hmm. and believing in that principle be needing to be practiced. Right. So that's where sometimes it can get a little tricky with like all the different groups, all the different right. groups are all considered still fundamentalists. Yes. And a lot of the people living in the community today there are still, you know, maybe they had multiple wives before they ended up leaving the belief that Warren Jeffs is in control of. So there's a lot of people that are still living the lifestyle, but just not the way Warren wants them to live anymore. And they've come back and reclaimed their homes and said, you know what, I'm not dealing with Warren Jeffs, but I, I feel that I have a right to live in my hometown. And so they come back. And fundamentally, wasn't it Joseph Smith who said that if there was ever a false prophet, that the Lord would like remove him from yeah. the head of the church, right? So the idea that there can be a false prophet without like throwing out the baby with the bathwater, right? Mm -hmm. Without throwing out all the fundamental beliefs is very, very common. So a lot of times when people are leaving certain aspects of fundamentalism or they're leaving the AUB or they're leaving the Kingston group or they're leaving the FLDS, especially I feel like within the FLDS, if they believe that Warren was a fallen prophet, that doesn't mean that they stop believing in the rest of the values, the rest of the fundamentals. They just think, oh, well, He's a false prophet and we can continue on with our beliefs in another direction. So right. it's not all or nothing for a lot of fundamentalists. Right. I do want to back up just a tiny bit here. When I mentioned that we moved across the street to this other home, as you can imagine, you saw that home. It was a mansion compared to what <laughs> I was raised in. And I remember as a young boy, some of me and my brothers ran across the street when we found out it was to be our new home. And we were just running all over the house against the rules, of course, because we weren't <laughs> supposed to run in the house. But, you know, we were just in every room, every closet. We were like, whoa, we could get lost in here. We just thought it was the most crazy and amazing thing. And interestingly, that home was recently finished before we moved over there by this family. And I can imagine how difficult it must have been for that family to be told by the church, you know, yes, you just finished this nice, beautiful home that you have, but your dad passed away, therefore you're out now. And I honestly don't know, maybe someone that was living there at that time could reach out and let us know, but I don't know where they ended up going, you yeah. know, but that's just the way things were. The church would say, hey, you're out, you move here, you move there. Sometimes the, the wives would be split up into different families, marrying different men, and that's just kind of the way it was, and they didn't really have control over that. So just wanted to point out, it was a big deal for us to move across the street to a big home, but it was also a very big deal for that family to have to leave the, their home. Yeah. It's sad when you look back like as an adult and you think about that, like you lose your husband and then you also lose your home. Right. At the same time, that would be so hard. Right. So by being fundamentalist, they're not part of the LDS church, part of the Mormon church as the outsiders would think. Yes. They practice polygamy. If they were, I guess if you want to call it lucky, if they were lucky enough to be given an extra wife, you know, because that okay. was, marriages were all arranged and completely dependent on what Warren Jeffs decided at the moment. If someone deserved another wife, if they were righteous enough, you okay. know, it was up to him. Okay, so I would think 
there's a supply and demand issue. Yes. There are only so many women to go around. <laughs> if a man is taking three or four, uh -huh. or 20, another right. man's getting nothing, right? <laughs> Surprisingly, you're not the only one with that question. <laughs> okay. And, <laughs> and so what, how that happened is, well, it became common for Warren Jeff to just kick people out of the community, okay. claim that they did something evil, okay. and say they're not worthy to be here anymore. Sure. And he would force them out of the community, and that would open up all of these, this room for women to be passed around to other men. Okay. Simple observation. I've seen a lot of pickup trucks in this town with limo <laughs> tents. Yeah, yeah. And jacked up a bit. Uh huh. What, what's going on with that? So that became a thing when I was out here where you buy a truck and you would spend all your money on it. We weren't allowed to spend our money on anything else. That was our one chance to spend money okay. that we wanted to spend money on. And not spending money on other things was primarily because the church wanted you to be giving a lot of money to them to help be, build up the kingdom of Zion, as they would say. And, you know, it was pretty common for a man to buy the truck that they wanted and put in all of this money, because if not, you know, that money would, if they weren't spending it, they couldn't really save it. And I guess that's the, the point that I wanted to make is savings accounts were not talked about that I know of. Mm -hmm. I had no idea that anyone or never heard of anyone saving their money. If it was any kind of saving, it was saving for the church. For the church, I've so that So that when the church said, we need money, they had the money sitting there to give to the church. So the more money they spent in the moment, the less money <laughs> they had to give away, I guess you could say. And if you think about it, the truck is the only thing that they get to own, right? The homes do not belong to them. Yep. Their property doesn't belong to them. Their, a lot of times their businesses don't belong to them. Right. They're signing everything over. So a vehicle is probably one of the only things you could own. Yeah, to my knowledge, a lot of the people out there did own their own vehicle and it was under their name. And so, yes, it was kind of that one thing that was their property and that they actually owned. And so I feel that that was one of the reasons they felt like they could actually do a lot to it. And I think we talk about this later on, but the homes, people didn't own their homes either. At least a lot of, uh, to my knowledge, there came a point when nobody did. The UEP or the trust that Warren was in charge of owned all of the property in the town. So you can imagine that's probably one of the reasons that people weren't in a big hurry to make their house nice and fancy and build it up to this beautiful home because they didn't know if they would have it the next day. Yeah, so. and why they put their money in their cars, which was actually theirs. <laughs> right. And so we would get away with getting a truck, doing all this stuff to it, to it. And we thought it was cool if no one could see in our trucks, you know, in case we had a girl in there or something, because that wasn't allowed. Dating was not allowed, ever. Okay, so tint it out so you could have a girl in there <laughs> or, yeah, and go up to the hills and do what you yep. need to do. So became, Is that what that was? Well, it became common to kind of hide, but it was also hiding from the outside world, you know? Like it was just became this very secretive thing in the community that no one wanted to be seen by the outside world. So it was us as teenagers getting away with things inside the, the community, but then the older people would do it as well to hide from the outside world. Can I just say, first of all, how weird it is to be watching myself right, <laughs> and, and talking and-, and I was and, thinking how handsome you okay. are. Well, I'm excited for when you come into the <laughs> video, so it's not just me talking. But I do have to say, Peter, it was so cool. I mean, I'm just watching back and thinking, it was just no stress. It was like two buddies hanging out. You know, it was so fun just hanging out with him for the day, honestly. So his questions are great, too. The picture here that uh, we just paused at is actually a road that leads down to the creek, as everyone knows it. And it, it's this small creek that runs through Short Creek or through the two cities, Hilldale and Colorado City. And that's where it gets the name the creek is because of the creek running through there. But that was also across the street from my childhood home. And we would just walk down this road here into the creek. And uh, this was actually through someone's property. Spencer Johnson was his name. And he was an older gentleman. And uh, we would get in a lot of trouble when we walked through his property. <laughs> so there came a point when we decided, hey, let's start asking for favors from him and see if we can build that trust, which is interesting how that works, right? Yeah. If you ask something of someone, and typically they're willing to help you out and it yeah. builds that bond. And so he would help us. He had shops back there and he would help us do welding and different things on our bicycles. And anyway, we became good friends because we were asking favors of him. <laughs> so <laughs> just an interesting memory that I had there. 
No, it's good to keep it moving. And you brought security, correct? I did. I did bring security. <laughs> there you are, babe. <laughs> yeah, flexing my muscles. Melissa. Yeah. So I see houses like this, and we'll see more, that are unfinished on the outside. Uh-huh. Why is that? So, you know, there are a lot of opinions about that. The most popular one is the fact that it was a tax break. If they don't finish the outside of their house, they don't have to pay certain taxes on that property. Unfortunately, the FLDS church tried to find a lot of ways to get around paying their taxes. <laughs> yeah, they did. To the point where Warren Jeffs just told people, don't pay your taxes. And you'll see on this building here on the side there's a UEP symbol yeah what's that so that stands for United Effort Plan and that was the organization put together by the FLDS Church trying to keep everyone together and basically the church owns everything now so we'll make sure that no one goes without but you turn in a lot to the church so that they have the means to then disperse it throughout the community. So a lot of people, they never owned, or most, everyone actually, never owned their homes out here. Interesting, it was all the church. Yep. It was all. I wanna to say too, just quickly, that this is a fundamental Mormonism principle called the law of consecration. Mm. And so the early church, Joseph Smith tried you know, making that happen, the law of consecration, where everybody combined everything, everyone just got according to their needs, kind of this utopian idea, and it failed. And then, even though it isn't practiced in the mainstream LDS church, to be a good standing member, you do still also kind of agree to the law of consecration, and we just believed that it wasn't necessary or asked of us right now. At this time. At yeah. this time, right? That no, that it wouldn't be successful at this time, so we don't do it. But there would come a time where it would be asked of us, and we would have to agree to it at that time. So right. it's still um, definitely a doctrine and a principle that's within all of Mormonism. And a lot of the smaller groups try it, right? So they try it, um, I believe, when we watched one of other Peter's other videos saying that they were trying it, um, the Christ Church, yep. right? It seems they, like they had that kind of idea. Yes. The Kingstons, they have their own bank. Every Everybody's paycheck goes into the bank, and then they get out what the church believes they need. So the Kingstons have tried it. I don't know about the AUB, but it's very doctrinally fundamental, this idea of consecration of the church kind of owning everything and giving and taking care of everybody and their needs. Yeah. And normally it fails. <laughs> yeah, so. it's tough. I've even heard some members of the mainstream LDS church say, oh, God would never ask that of us because it's not necessary now, you know. But you agree to the idea that everything you own and everything that you are does belong to God in the building up of his church and kingdom on earth. Yeah, so, within the LDS, mainstream. Yeah. So even the mainstream. So that is a fundamental idea that has been passed on and continues on through even the, the mainstream, modern day, I guess you could say, uh, Mormon church. Yes, but we live comfortably believing that it's not actually going to ever come down to that. <laughs> exactly. All the church's property? It's owned by the, U the United Effort Plan. You'd pay a tithe of 10% right no, to the church? No, here, here was different. The, the mainstream LDS church is 10%. In the FLDS, it was more of the leader would stand up on the pulpit and say, every man over the age of 18 needs to give us several thousand dollars for such and such thing. Okay. So there were tithing calls, as they would call them. They would just get up and say, we need the money, and everyone would turn it in. So the church owned most of the town at one time? The church owned all of the town at one time. Wow. Unless, unless there was someone living here that didn't belong to the church, maybe that property didn't belong to the church. Okay. But the church owned everyone's homes. Everyone was completely... They were under the direction of Warren Jeffs, and he had power over them in every aspect of their life, down to their kids, their wives, their homes. Everything they owned belonged to the church. This is a good example of Warren in hiding. So this home right here is now turned into a hotel called the Most Wanted Hotel. Okay. <laughs> you know, because Warren was most wanted by the FBI for a while. He built this as a second home for himself. We'll see his first home as well. But during some, some of the time when the FBI was after him, during that era, he was staying here in this home. Now it's a hotel. Anyone can stay there if they pay the fee. Just wanted to point out, uh, there have been different opinions about this. I've heard from some people say that Warren Jeffs never stayed here, uh, that it wasn't his home. But I've heard other people as well that were close in his circle say that he did hide out in this home and had a lot of his wives living in this home at one time when they were asked, how did so many wives, because at one point he had almost 80 wives, and the question was asked, how did he 
fit all of these wives into one home? And one of the answers was this, a lot of them were staying here. A lot of them were staying in Texas uh, at their ranch there. So uh, there's been different opinions about this, but I have heard that he used this as a place to stay and hide out and have some of his family stay for times. Bit creepy to stay there, perhaps? I have not been in that one, and I don't plan on staying in it, to be honest. <laughs> there are certain things. I'm not super, super superstitious about a lot of things. Yeah. But there are certain things when it brings up certain memories of your childhood, especially when I respected someone like Warren Jeff so, so much and deeply and fully believed in him. Until and, what age? Well, honestly, I left the church at 18, but I didn't leave because I stopped believing in Warren. I still believe that he was the prophet, believe it or not. And I thought, you know, maybe down the road after I, after I go out and uh, experience life a little bit and realize that I'm wrong, maybe I'll come back and join the church again because that's the only way to heaven. That's still what I believed at age 18 when I left. And so I was, it was after I le had left and had been out for about six months that I realized and started hearing all of the stuff that he had been doing and realized that he was a false prophet and doing a lot of awful things. So growing up, that was normality to you to have multiple mothers. Oh, yes. My father, he was the mayor of Hilldale. When I was uh, about uh, nine years old, my father married his fourth wife. That's where he stopped. That was his, he ended up with four wives and that was it. But yes, it was very normal. Every child knew exactly who their mother was. There was never a question of who do I belong to? Are you my mother? I never asked that question. <laughs> but each mother would give a little bit more of attention to their own children. My mother would pull us aside and make sure that, you know, we were living a certain way that she thought was the best for her children. Okay. But as far as tasks go, everyone just pitched in. It was like one big family. We all lived in the same house. We all used the same kitchen, ate together. I would sleep in the same room with a lot of my brothers that were from a different mother. It was more about the age. I was probably closer to, the, to some of my brothers from a different mother because I was closer to them in age. So. Brother from another mother <laughs> came from FLDS. <laughs> exactly. Who knew? Exactly. <laughs> The first time I said that to my family and I was trying to describe something and I was like, no, that's the, we're meeting his brother from another mother. And it came out and I just started busting up too. And my family started laughing. They're like, wow, this actually applies for the first time. Yeah. Just wanted to expand on something I said about the mothers knowing or the children knowing who they belong to and how that kind of worked in the house is my mother, just as an example, I know. I have so many memories with her, which is impressive considering that there were other mothers in the home on top of the fact that she had 12 of us. So my mother alone has 12 children. And the, the, the way that she was able to make sure that we each felt her love and attention was pretty impressive. And I'm, I can only speak for my mother. I don't know how the other children felt towards their mother. I hope they have a similar experience. But it was pretty impressive that she was able to give that time. I mean, we would go on walks together, the, in, the number of walks that we would just go on together, just me and her, and uh, mm -hmm. visits to the park and visits to this and that. And of course, she would use those opportunities as, as ways to teach and train and all of the things that she felt was important for us. That right? you do as a mother, yeah. Exactly. But so at the time though just looking back all i remember is my mother loved me and wanted to spend time with me that's that's what i got out of out of it all i will say she was is probably the strongest believer of all the believers of the flds i dare say uh man she just fully fully believes and she made sure that we all felt the same when we were out there so when i left at age 18 i just destroyed just crumbled her world, honestly. I was the first of her children to move out of the community to leave the church. And to this day, I oh, it, it hurts. It hurts me to even think about what it did to her because I know, I know what it did to her as far as how painful it was. But the fact that I was put in a position where it was, you're stuck and you're trapped in this forever, or you severely hurt your mother emotionally and mentally and all of that, is it was just an impossible position to be in. Yeah, it's so hard. So what's your relationship like now with your mother? It's not, yeah. So when I made, thank you, when I made the decision to move away because I 
had chosen to live a different lifestyle. I didn't want to live this way anymore. Some of the rules I disagreed with. One of those very obvious rules were not allowed to date, not allowed to have any kind of relationship before marriage because all of the marriages were completely arranged by the prophet. So when I made that decision, I was also making the decision, which I knew, unfortunately, that I was not welcome back. I was not welcome back to the community. I was not welcome back to my family or the home or anything mm -hmm. like that. So okay. that's what that meant and that's where it is today. It hasn't changed all these years later. I don't have any kind of relationship with my mother. Does and that wasn't a family rule, just FYI, the not welcome back part. That was a church rule, and that was specifically a church rule by Warren Jeffs, because before Warren Jeffs became the prophet, I remember as a young boy, I had my oldest brother, actually, which was, he was so far gone before I ever was born. I have a very large range in sibling <laughs> ages. So my oldest brother would come around for Thanksgivings, back way back in the day when we celebrated and had fun and did things like that he would come and he was there for those and so it wasn't always the case but by the time i moved out the rules were as such that the church rules were as such that we were not allowed to come back in fact we were told or the people living and following warren's rules and his commandments i guess you could say they were told that if they associated with apostates, and that was the name of those that left the church, that they would be in some way or another chastised. In some cases, they would be kicked out of the community. They would lose their family and homes and everything else. So it was a very strong rule to not associate with apostates. And it got like even more strict even after you left too. Like it was already strict. Mm. Sam wasn't allowed to go back to the family and influence his siblings in any type of way. But like his parents, his biological parents are the ones that dropped him off at the MTC for his That's LDS true. mission, right? So yeah. there were like small exceptions where his parents might be able to see him, but he couldn't go back. Right. But then it was while you were on your mission, right? That it got so strict that by the time you came back, oh, yes. you didn't get to, you haven't seen her since you got back from your mission, right? So between 2010 and 2012, everything just came. I mean, it was crazy enough when I left in 2008, but it just came crumbling down. And this was during the time that I was in Chile. And it wasn't, you know, like I left in 2008, mid 2008, I was on a mission, you know, a year and a half later. So it was a pretty quick transition. And yes, you are correct. Before or right after I left, I wasn't allowed to go back to home, back to my house, mingle with the family, that type of thing. But there were some exceptions when the parents could leave and meet up with their children that had left. And so that was awesome. But by the time I got back, that was no longer allowed. And I have not seen or spoke, like met with my mother since that time. Does your mother live here? Not here anymore. She lives in a nearby town. Most everyone that believes in Warren Jeffs have moved at this point. He told them to move because too many apostates, those that had le have left the church, were moving into the town. And so he told everyone to leave. A lot of people live in Cedar City, Utah, Kanab, okay. Utah, nearby, nearby town. So you're an apostate I in am. your eyes. Yes. So a lot of your types that grew up here, moved away, are coming back because they have rights to some of the land. Is that correct? That is common, yes. A lot okay. of people are coming back and reclaiming their homes, whether it was their childhood home or a home that they built themselves. They are coming back and getting those homes back. This big building here, this was Warren Jeff. Sorry, quickly, just in case people are wondering, like, how do you come back and reclaim your house? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Basically, the United Effort Plan or the trust that the church owned, that owned all the property, the state of Utah ended up removing Warren Jeffs as being in charge of that. Mm -hmm. um, he didn't show up to certain hearings or something like that. Anyway, so the state of Utah ended up taking over the trust from him and taking it from him. Right. And when that happened... <clears throat> I mean, the church was already falling apart as far as the things that Warren Jeff, Jeff was asking of people and where the people were living and all of that. And Warren Jeff had told all the people to stop paying their property taxes completely. And they started having eviction notices and the government was coming through. And it was crazy. We went out there at this one point 
where they had the women and children and all these families that had been told by the prophet, don't pay your taxes, <laughs> have been evicted and living in huge, massive tents mm -hmm. in the community, just set up in the middle as like refuge for these people because they were getting kicked out and evicted from their homes. Yeah. So that was a massive, massive mess, basically, when Warren was telling people not to pay their taxes. So after all the evictions and all, everybody moved out of the community that was following Warren Jeffs, basically... All of those homes basically just had to have the back taxes paid on them. There was tax liens on all of them. And so the apostates were able to come in and the trust knew about the situation, what had happened, why people, you know, why people were getting evicted and right. kind of the whole community situation. And so they were, you could go and apply. They would say, this is what I've contributed to the community. This is what I've contributed to this specific home. And there was uh, basically a board of people who would decide and then if those if whoever was awarded the home could pay the back taxes on it and it was a small amount per square foot i mean super small i think it was like ten dollars a square foot right. then they could buy the home back so it was quite an interesting process maybe i'll try to find a picture of those tents um but when they talk about the housing situation and people leaving and kind of what all came to a head at that there was a lot to yeah that Oh, yeah. Jeff's home is now the Dream Center. So What's that? that? The Dream Center is a refuge place for people that are leaving the church. Mostly women and children will reside here. Some men uh, do, but mostly women and children that need the support and the help making that transition. And in some cases, hiding from FLDS members still because they'll come and try to get those children back. So. They need this place to hide in some cases and also just to help get them on their feet. This big block wall here, uh, as a young boy, I helped build it. Do you remember Warren Jeffs? Oh, yes. What was he like? He was uh, very intimidating. I thought he talked with God. I thought it was a normal thing that he would literally go and have conversations with God. That's what we were told, that he was this perfect man that could do no wrong. But I met him multiple times in his in his yard here. So do they feel American or they don't even think about that? It's just the relationship with God and that's it. That's that's what it all comes down to. They don't they believe that the law of God is way, way, way above the law of the land. As far as the American laws and things like that, they are way below the laws of God. Just want to point out what I'm saying is true and became more true over time with Warren Jeffs. But I remember as a young boy my father being the mayor of Hildell, Utah, was extremely patriotic. You know, I remember him writing, you know, we had the parades for the 4th of July. I remember him riding down on the horse, holding an American flag through the parade. And also we did things for the 24th of July, the, when Utah became a state. So we were very, a very patriotic family. And I remember my father telling us things like, you know, we need to obey the law of the land and that that was important as a young boy. It seemed like as Warren took over and as he started making up these new rules, it put into the mind of the followers, of his followers, that, you know what, the government rules and the American rules and laws aren't all that important anymore. And just want to point out, it wasn't always that way. In yeah. fact, sorry, one more thing. In fact, my father served in the military as a young man. So just to point out that things used to be very different. Yeah, and that it's family by family as well, right? Yeah, yes, that is very true. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's why if Warren says, hey, don't pay your taxes, they say, done deal, I'm not paying my taxes because that's what he's telling us to do. And he's still doing that from prison right now. Oh, yes. Life sentence, correct? Uh-huh, life sentence. He's in there for, for life, two, two life sentences, How I does believe. the message get out? He writes, he writes uh, letters also for a long time. He was given phone call privileges where he would call to certain homes and everyone would gather in and he would actually talk to them for hours okay. from his prison and given them what he would call revelations on how they should live. How many are still following him? Well, at this point, there's about 5,000 that, that still believe in the FLDS belief in church. Okay. And for those that 100% believe in Warren Jeffs as this godlike figure, at least 2,500 which is low compared to what it used to be. They'll do anything he says? Anything. 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 Yep. Wow. And I was I was with some fundamentalists yesterday. Uh-huh. And this is where it gets confusing not to you but for outsiders. <laughs> yeah. 
they uh, they want to have nothing to do with FLDS, right? And yeah. they thought what happened here is insane. Oh, it, it was. Right? And they're all about uh, mutual consent right. with their marriages, nothing right. below 18. I don't know the inner workings right. of any group, and you know, just by doing one video, but they seem to be in a good place. Like they're really cool and, and almost light to hang around. Yeah. Which was not what I'd expect. Yeah. So it's people. It's, people all have their opinions. The FLDS think that the mainstream Mormon church is the big and bad church that went astray. Uh, the Mormon church looks at the FLDS church as the the wicked people that we we can't be associated with them because they're doing all of these awful things, which is true. Most of the awful things were done by Warren Jeffs, though, and the followers were just trying to live good lives. This was a. I was just going to say, along with that, the fundamental group and how nobody wants to be associated with the FLDS, everyone, if the FLDS people were willing to talk mm -hmm. and, and not have that secretiveness to them, or if you had asked somebody, you know, before the Jeff's reign and you went and just like talked with people, I think they would have seemed a lot more similar to the fundamentalist group oh, yeah. that Peter was talking about, that they would um, feel lighthearted. Like if you're in with them, they're going to seem lighthearted. They do not feel that they're being oppressed in any way. They're just trying to live good lives. They're going to have a lot of the same similar beliefs that this other fundamental group that that Peter talked to have as well. So because of Warren's leadership in particular and the secretiveness and the walls and all of that, it built this wall up between the FLDS and other fundamentalist groups. Oh, yes. Right? And well, they don't want anything to do with him, which makes sense. Nobody wants anything to do with Warren Jeffs. <laughs> right, which makes perfect sense, right? But the Warren Jeffs and what he was doing was plastered all of the, over the news as well. So, of course, the other groups, especially the fundamentalist groups, are not going to want to have their name associated with him at all because of all of the things that everyone in the world is now seeing, right? Yeah. So that was a big part of it. But if you took out, if you took away the crazy revelations from him since he was put in prison or mm -hmm. even right before prison, if you took away the Warren Jeffs extra revelations from being a prophet and you went back to Roland Jeffs and you took the other fundamentalist group beliefs and you took the FLDS beliefs, they're going to match up very, very similarly. You know, right. like all of them have those same fundamental beliefs. And so it really comes down to whoever's modern day prophet, what that prophet is saying. Right. You know. And each individual, even within the FLDS, but even, I mean, every everyone in the world, of course, but speaking for the FLDS, every individual has their decision on how they want to live their life as well, right? Mm -hmm. I remember growing up, there was a lot of laughter in my family, right? I mean, it wasn't all doom and gloom. Yeah. I mean, we were afraid for our lives <laughs> a lot of the times because Warren Jess would claim that the end was coming. But we still tried really hard to have a good time, to have family get-togethers and to laugh and joke about things as much as possible. So just so you know, it does seem very doom and gloom now for everyone involved in the FLDS. But for the most part, a lot of families do find those times to enjoy their life. And I know that's the same. You look back on history during World War One, World War Two. I'm sure that people in the best way they could still tried to make the best out of it that they could, you know, in the situation that they were in. Hmm. A very interesting point the guys with yesterday brought up. He's like, so you casually dated before you're married. I'm like, yeah. So you would be with a woman and then and then leave her and then be with another woman? I'm uh -huh. like, yeah, that's sort of secular America, right? Yeah. And he's like, where are the values in that? You didn't support her. <laughs> you didn't help her out in her life in the long run. You were, you were, just, you were just there to leave? What yeah, is that? That's an interesting point. And I'm like, mm, interesting. And then the relationships I saw yesterday, it was interesting. There was a young couple that they're in a monogamous relationship, mm -hmm. but it sounds like perhaps down the road it might become Be interested in another, polygamous, uh -huh. and I can't imagine that struggle in that. But yeah. do you think there are happy polygamous relationships, as in the guy having two, three, four wives, and it's a good thing and it functions well, or do you think it's just pretty much impossible to make that work? You know, I think that it is possible. I think there, there is the possibility of a good, happy relationship in polygamy. Now, do I think that it's the common? No, I don't. I've seen and heard too much about people, the jealousy, you know, 
The jealousy is the biggest, but a lot of cases, even if the wife wants to be a part of it, there's still the human instinct and the jealousy behind it, and it does cause problems. This whole block, this whole... I just have to say, along with that, I put in my two cents as far as whether or not polygamy could work. Mm. I think that it can only work, or people would say that they were happy in it, under religious circumstances. Because we've watched and reviewed lots of stuff and seen other people try to have polyamory or this or that. And the only quote unquote like happy families that we've ever seen are people who believe it so religiously that they are able to overcome the jealousy because they think that it's absolutely necessary for their eternal salvation. And I feel like anything short of something as important as their eternal salvation being tied to it working, I think it would fall short and it wouldn't be able to work. Right. So just had yeah, to throw a lot that of, in there. A lot of people, you, you know, they try to put on a, a brave and happy face, right? And to some extent, I think that some of them have overcome that jealousy. But like you said, for the reason that they were raised in it, they were taught the importance of it, and they fully believe that it is their only return to God and salvation. Mm. The whole city block is surrounded by these walls and it was Warren, it was Rulin. His dad owns the house out in the corner, which we'll take a look at. Oh yeah, way up there. Way up there, okay. yeah. If you got inside these walls, you were somehow special because it was so closed off. The gate that we saw open to the garages where Warren Jeffs would pull in with his car, those were never open like they are now. Okay. They would open and they would close. There were video cameras everywhere. It was. It was very intense. I look back now and think, I can't believe I lived in that. Like, you know, it seems so crazy that I was ever a part of it. Wow. But local law enforcement or members of the church, okay. they also did what Warren said. So that makes things tricky, right? So ha you had your own country out here, basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Warren was the king and everyone bowed to him, basically. Exactly. And the crazy thing is, it wasn't always like that. Before Warren Jeffs, you know, his, his dad, was also starting to get things turned a little bit crazy. But before, before the Jeffs took over, it seemed to be a pretty good community. The only problems they ever had with the law was the fact that uh, polygamy was a felony at the time. But other than that, there wasn't the tax fraud and the other things that the FLDS church started doing later on. So Melissa's trying to get us into this home, right? That's the goal. Let's see, what, let's see how she did. Melissa, thumbs up or thumbs down? Oh, oh wow. wow, cool. Oh, Gladys is here, yay. Gladys is here, not only that, but she also called Luke for us, and he said he's gonna come give us a full tour for you. Oh, oh wow. We were here 10 minutes, but that was about five minutes ago. Amazing. You're a hero. Because were around the back, <laughs> so I was doing laps in the- You're a hero. <laughs> you did it, babe. We're gonna come <laughs> here. This is we where a lot of families, mm -hmm. especially women and children, who are needing a place to transition out of polygamy, come here. They have, I believe it's 40 rooms. There are kids who don't even have birth certificates. They don't have social security numbers. They've got nothing because of the timing of them being born into the community. Yeah. It's a really awesome organization. It's like poetic justice a little bit that it's in one of Warren Jeff's old home because he reached so that's much havoc, in, That's right? interesting they decided yeah. to do it here. Why is that, do you think? Well, Brielle Decker, okay. she was the 65th wife of Warren Jeffs. And when she came back, she was able to reclaim this property because when the UEP was handing back out properties after a whole property tax issue that was going on, they were giving them and trying to let people reclaim their homes. That's who we're meeting? We're not meeting Brielle. She's not here today. She's okay. fabulous though. Okay. I will say real quick, two things. One, we'll leave a link above to our video of Brielle giving us a tour mm -hmm. of the Dream Center and our talks with her um, because she is awesome. So if you want to hear more about her story, you can click above. Also, I have to do our plug for our holiday fundraiser again. Yes, this is where it is. This is where it is. This is where we are hoping to adopt a room. Well, not hoping anymore. Thanks to all of you and the amazing donations. We will. Um, we will be adopting a room and be renovating a room for people to stay in. And if you want to donate to that cause, there is a link down below for that as well. Yes. Oh, okay. We are meeting yeah. Gladys. She works here. And she works okay. here. Okay. And she also... I'll let you see how much of her story she wants to share, but okay. she's fantastic. And former then, FLDS. Former yes. FLDS. And Brielle Decker, she donated this to the Dream Center so that it could become this. So she found the Dream Center is an organization that has different homes all over the okay. U.S. Okay. And places to help people. And she was able to give them this home to be able to help these people. Okay. So. 
<laughs> okay, so Gladys, where are we? Um, this is, well, what used to be Warren Jeff's house. They reassigned the house several times, like they did to everybody in the community. And so the third person after Warren that lived here, he had, I believe, eight wives. My mom had been reassigned to him, okay. and including my mom and her kids. He had 101 kids. This is the, well, what we're using now is a staff kitchen. This is super fun, by the way, because while while Peter was walking around with Gladys here and doing this, I actually wasn't there for all of this. So this no. will be fun to see what she says. I've seen bits and pieces and heard of things, but uh, this is fun to watch kind of her side of things. Yes, as well. we love Gladys so very much. And we were glad that she was willing to talk to Peter and show him around. But yeah, we weren't, we didn't want there to be too many voices or people talking over each other so we just let yeah. her go with him so we were chatting is... and playing hide and seek in this big house no, <laughs> no. <laughs> the first time i came and visited here i had walked over from rule and jeff's house over there and walked here to warren's house okay and i came into this kitchen and they were serving dinner warren was sitting in the dining room there with his family there was probably three moms in the kitchen at the moment and several teenage daughters helping prepare a meal in this kitchen this kitchen, just want to point out, is completely, it has not been changed at all. The original. This is completely original. The cabinets, the countertops, the floor, everything you see here is the way it was when Warren Jeffs was living in it. So it's kind of crazy that it stayed that long because Gladys mentioned that even this home was given to different families, mm -hmm. which I honestly didn't know that. I thought Warren owned this house until, until it was taken from him. So I didn't know that uh, he actually passed it on to different families as well. But the, the fact that they left this kitchen exactly the way it was and lots of other parts in this home is pretty crazy that it has been this long. Yeah. These halls had carpet up too about here. It was like this green floral carpet with a border thing on top of it. Oh, they're hiding over there? What's up? What's up? It's all right. We I'm know you're they caught us. <laughs> Warren Jeff's room. This was his actual room, Warren Jeff's room. You feel, yeah. And so this was his actual room. And then this is the only speaker that can go throughout the entire house. If that gives you an idea, this is a very large house. And he's the only one that can talk through the entire thing. This was his bedroom. This was his, this bedroom. Was his bedroom. Which is interesting because it's one of the smallest homes or rooms small in the home. Okay. And he would actually brag about that. See, I'm humble. I have the small room. Yes, okay. he would. Uh, our also, weird, creepy facts. The carpet is like super squishy, like super, super soft, and it is a soundproof room. The door, everything, yeah. Everything is soundproof. soundproof. And it, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, just saying we don't even want to think about what was going on behind those doors, but. For... Yeah, and they showed, and you might be able to see it a little bit here in the door jam, like the door jams were made so that you couldn't like there wasn't even space in between the door jams so that people couldn't see and they had mentioned to us that like the doors would open towards the wall like normally when you open up a door it goes towards the wall right so that it opens to the room their doors would open the opposite way so that when you opened it you couldn't see into the room you could only see against the wall mm -hmm. and i thought that was an interesting fact as well like the fact that that way people could peek out and no one could see what was happening in the room just super creepy yeah. I'm saying that. Did you have a close relationship with him, or how was it? Oh, in a way, yes. My dad's first, second wife was his sister. Okay. And so I knew him from then on. His, his sister, another sister, was my best friend. So, so you were saying carpeting, can we go down here? Yeah, Is that was, okay? The, yeah, there was carpeting all the way down the hall. That was it common. helped with all these little kids that were around that had all these little hands and injuries. If they bumped <laughs> their head on the wall or whatever, this carpet's all soft. And, so when did you leave FLDS? Uh, about a year ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. Interesting. How is it? Is it, is, it a, is it a tough journey or has it been it's, liberating or how is it? It's liberating. Yes, okay. it's liberating. Um, it's just to the support system outside. I don't feel like I always have to, I wonder if I'm going to, if what I'm doing is what's right. <laughs> okay. And okay. so it's, yeah, when I was in it, I felt like I was happy. It was, I, I was one of four wives, and I felt like that was the best thing for my kids. And this is great, you know, I have living babysitters. If I need to go do something, then I can just say, here, sister wife, you can watch my kids. And she's like, oh, sure, I'd be glad to. And I would do the same for her. I had so many kids to love. It's, it's, it was great. I loved it. 
Gladys is a good example of the fact that a lot of times women aren't leaving because of the polygamous aspect of it. So people will look at polygamy and say, oh, the women are being oppressed um, by being in that. And so they should just want to get out of it and not have to share their husband. And it's a good example of Gladys saying no. Like she didn't have any problem with the polygamous aspect of it. She'll share here in a minute what she did have a problem with. But it's not... People don't always leave just because of the polygamous aspect. People right. leave for a lot of different reasons. Especially when you're raised in that culture, it's so easy to be okay with it and to just, you know, live that lifestyle. It seems to be so much easier for those that are raised in it. Yeah. Do you miss your sister wives at all? Oh, absolutely. Love them. So you don't keep yes. in touch with them or do you? No, they're still in the church. They're, they're still in the church. They okay. refuse to talk to them. So they were in a way like your best friends? Oh, for sure. Isn't it hard for you to have been in this world, left, but then now you're, oh, you're yeah, working in here? Oh, yeah, I miss it a lot. You miss it a lot? Yes, I miss it. What? What exactly? Um, the friendship, the having people around all the time, having, if you have a tough day or need to talk about something, you have a sister, a sister wife, a friend, you can just go to and talk to, and they understand your situation. And right. Have shoulders to cry on or laugh with or... You know, people to ask advice from, hey, this kid got hurt, this kid's going through this, and we just always just like living best friends. So and the you, kids felt the same way. The you think you made the right decision then? In By leaving? I had to. You had to, I had to okay. pull my kids out of a dangerous situation. Okay, okay. So, so that's when motherly instincts just come right into, yep. and you do what you got to do. Yeah, up to last year I had decided that I had to stay in the church for my kids. Okay. And then last year... After they started, I was afraid they were being trafficked, so I had to just pull them out. Okay. So when you were looking, when you were in the church? Another link that I want to leave above, when she says a year ago, she was worried that they were going to be trafficked and some of the dangers. And we recently went to a fundraiser and heard her speak some more. So on the revelations that Warren Jeffs gave a year ago and the dangers that that is, rather than go into it so that this is a, you know, we don't want this to be four hours right. long for you, I will leave a link above to that video on Warren Jeffs' revelations and why they're so concerning and why, after those revelations, Gladys decided to take her children out. Right. And being trafficked, meaning that the church <laughs> is taking children from their parents in a lot of cases without even telling the parents about it. They just tell, they will send someone that's in charge and they will tell the children, hey, this is what the prophet wants, this is what God wants, and the children will just leave without even saying goodbye to their mother in some cases or their father. So it's a very <clears throat> sad and uh, serious situation. Yeah, and when we when people hear the word trafficked, I mean, that can mean a lot of different things. It's people don't normally think of sexual trafficking, but within the FLDS, there's multiple different kinds. A lot of times the boys are um, labor trafficked. Mm. The, the boys will go and be forced to be working on construction sites for insane amount of hours, no pay. It all goes to the church um, from a very young age. The girls, a lot of times, are being prepared to be brides, underage brides. And so to them, that doesn't look like trafficking, which is what makes it so tricky, is the kids don't realize that they're being trafficked because to them, they're just working like all their brothers and their fathers and everyone else. Yeah. And the girls think they're just getting ready for celestial marriage and um, not recognizing that both of those things are not normal and not okay. Right. And say you came into contact with somebody like me, a Gentile, mm -hmm. what were your thoughts? Did you look really down? You try to avoid the outside no, world? No, you're or? just a Gentile, so you're fine. You don't know better. Okay. And so you're just fine. We can talk to you. We don't go into depth or try to become friends, but you're fine because you're just a Gentile. You're not an apostate. You don't have a... I'm not like Sam uh, who left. Yeah, you don't have an <laughs> alternate a t intention to pull me out of the church. Okay. Oh, so this was the kitchen. The maximum amount of people you'd have in this home was how many? The maximum I saw was, oh, well over 100. So just but kids running around everywhere, we, well, wives. Yeah, yeah. well, each mom kept track of their, her own kids. Uh, I was mopping in this kitchen one day. When, so when I stayed here, I was pregnant with one of my kids, and I was mopping the floor. Uh -huh. and. She came in and she says, you know, when I was pregnant with my 19th child, I mopped the floor and the next morning I had my baby. <laughs> okay. And I was just like, 19th <laughs> child? I was pregnant with my fifth. Wow. 19, that's a full-time job. Uh-huh. Yeah, so we... It's like but the, the older ones help with the younger ones. And 
Okay, so if it wasn't for the trafficking issues, and I don't want to get into that because I'm sure it's super sensitive. Right, right. Um, would you have stayed in? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if, that, if those issues never happened, you think that would be the better decision to stay in? Um, I liked the lifestyle. I liked having lots of kids and having lots of <laughs> friends around and stuff. Right. Um, now that I look back on a lot of things, I can see that it was not the best decision to be there, but now I would have never made that choice. What about the police? She made the exact point we were trying to make that now she's been out for a while and, and she's only been out for a year at this point, but now that she's been out for a while, she can look in and say, okay, there were things that weren't okay, but when she was in it, and there's still a lot of things that she looks at as things that were okay, but it takes looking from the outside in to realize that there's even a problem. Yeah, but if you ask somebody who's in it, they're going to say, like she would have, you know, maybe two years ago before anything else happened, yeah. she would have said, I'm perfectly happy. I love this. This is my choice. It's my free agency. Yeah. A lot of things similar to what we heard from the other fundamentalist group. Yeah. Polygamous aspect. Was that a challenge? Your husband having many partners? To me, partners? it never was. It wasn't? No. Okay, it walk never. us through that, that, that don't understand that world. It's, it's, um, you just don't have jealousy issues. No, I didn't. I mean, a lot of people did. There was a lot of problem with that. Okay. But I, it was just all I'd ever known. So it was just like, okay, well, I'm sharing my husband, and if I can help a sister or sister wife or whatever, and I was always just happy to help her if she was having trouble getting along with him or if I was or if she's having a hard day, he could call me and say, hey, has she talked to you about anything? You know, it was just more of a big group of everybody working together. Okay, so some wives would have problems, mm -hmm. jealousy issues, and yeah. others wouldn't. Well, it's, or do I mean, they, do I you think, think underneath they they all, sometimes. They oh, yeah. I never did. I mean, you never did? Underneath. No. Really? Wow. Yeah, it's just... I never, it never was a problem to me. I guess I never fell in love. Maybe. I don't know. Okay. Maybe if you're in. But I loved the kids. I loved the situation. I loved my sister wives. See, and that comes back to the idea that I think anybody who could be completely happy and have a happy marriage within polygamy, if it's religious, and then even more with the FLDS where they're not picking their husbands. So they're living the law and the principle of it without the jealousy because. If you never love your husband yeah, in that way and you're purely only living it for the religious aspect, for the sister wives, for the children, and that's what your focus is, then you can be actually truly happy like what Gladys was. That's a very key point that she made there that I'm glad she said that, that if you're, if you don't fall in love, you can love someone without falling in love with them, I very think. true. Yeah, I'm sure Gladys still had love for her husband. Right. And so there's that difference there. And if it's all done through the church, almost like a, a transaction, <laughs> right? I, I don't mm -hmm. want to come across as that people didn't love each other in that, but unless you're the first wife, I can imagine that the first wife would have more jealousy with other people coming in once you've created that bond with just you and your husband. But if you're marrying in the second, third, or fourth wife, at that point, you're just marrying into a family that already has all of, all of these other women. And so that's, I mean... How how could you fall in love with someone in the traditional way if they're already married to all of these other women, you know? Yeah, I don't know. You see like the Browns. That's true. And then you see... And Robin. And then you see, I mean, the fourth wife ended up being so... <laughs> and then you see Cody and Robin. I think That's just, a whole different mess though. <laughs> I don't even know. I'm just saying, I think it just depends on the situation, depends on the person. But there's a good example yeah. of the fact that someone could be living plural marriage and be sincerely happy in that and not have the jealousy issues and it is person by person it is family by family basis and whether or not it could be successful right okay and so I don't that's know. interesting i never thought of it that way so if you were in deep true love maybe it would be more of a challenge maybe or else well we were told a saying that was quite popular among the church uh -huh. by ruling was if you love me you love those who i love okay and so that's how I thought of it. It's, well, I love him, so I love all of his family. Hmm. If I look back at what I know now, then I probably would have looked for an opportunity to leave the religion, seeing that, you know, my kids are going to be trafficked. I don't want them lost. I don't want to never see them again. What does it mean, trafficked? Somebody takes them to another Somebody location? Takes them, yeah, and you don't have any idea where they went. That's how it worked right. in FLDS? Uh -huh. 
they can just take your kids and... Mm -hmm. your, your kids belong to God, not to you. Oh, wow. In, in the Bible, there's a story, a uh, story of Hannah and Samuel. Okay. And that's how it was. She dedicated her kids to God. And after the child was old enough, she literally took him to the temple and said, here, take my child. And that's how we lived. Hmm. And mm. when you were in it, that all seemed normal. Mm. Just one more example of scripture being used. You know, people will oftentimes will hear people say, oh, these people must not actually believe in like the Bible. They must not believe in the true the truthfulness of the Bible or the true word of God or this, that, or whatever that person believes in. But this is just an example of how, you know, the FLDS does believe in the Bible and they use the Bible. And Warren just himself is quite the scriptorian. Oh, yeah. And he uses the scriptures to justify his actions. Now, of course, there's going to be a lot of people that say, well, he's obviously going about it all wrong. And I agree, but yes. everyone can interpret the scriptures differently and they can use the scriptures in a way to convince other people to look at it the same way they are yeah. and convince them that it's okay to do all of these in a lot of cases, especially with Warren Jeffs that are just awful. Yeah. So taking your kids, but there's a Bible example of, or a biblical example of this is why we're doing it and this is why it's okay. Yeah. That Until it didn't. Did, yes. The part that I have to give up my kids all of a sudden I'm like, okay, no. Okay. But up to everything else, if I felt like that my kids were happy and safe, then yes. So how many other women in FLDS were okay with the kids get taken away versus not okay with it? I don't, I can't say what a woman yeah. thinks because a lot, you don't dare say what you think when it comes to resisting authority. Sure. Um, but no mom is going to willingly give up her kids. For you, is it a challenge every day now? Or oh, is it? Uh -huh. It is. Yes. OK. Uh, my All six of my daughters are still very faithful to FLDS. So you don't talk with them? I don't talk to the three older ones. OK. Yesterday was actually my third daughter's birthday. It's been exactly one year yesterday since she turned 18 and went back to FLDS. She was out of it and then went she, back? She was actually here with me. Oh. And, and did, did she go back because she missed the community? Birthday, she felt went back because that's what her salvation requires. Wow. Um, so you're in a tough... Oh, yeah. Peter's going to say what I'm thinking, but that's why it's so tough on these moms. They've been raising their... If they're raising their children in what they believed their whole lives in righteousness, then their kids are going to want to go back because that's what they've been taught. Exactly. Tough position. Yeah. <laughs> you, you have but, such a good spirit about you, though. Well... That's, that's amazing. That's the only way to go about it is you can't beat somebody or conquer an emotion, a problem with hate. Yep. You have to conquer through love. I, I like love the positive so light, but at the same time, there is moms with their kids missing. There's My kids were missing for almost five years. I cannot imagine. And so that's a very important negative aspect, but... I don't like to focus on the negative, except for that moms need to have and live with their kids. Name and title, sir. <laughs> oh, sorry. Last thing I'm glad. She gives me the chills. I just love her so much and have, oh, my heart just goes out so much for her situation and the fact that she's so brave in sharing her story with people to be able to help find other people's children and to... You know, she's just such a happy, positive person, even with everything that she's going through. Like, she has every right to be a negative person and to be angry and upset about everything. And instead, she's just such a light. Yeah. And, and I she's just love her. a great example of FLDS members that are trying to live the best life they can and even trying to stay positive through very difficult uh, situations and try to make the best out of life. And, you know, it's, it's just... Unfortunately, so many are f trapped in that situation where to some extent they don't even realize that they're in a bad situation and yeah. they're just trying to go about living the best life they can. They're just good people trying their best. Yeah. Uh, My son Salome, he's been missing since March of 2021. They said that he ran away from his father's house. What are your thoughts on it? Honestly, they're really good at hiding people of any age. I personally feel like he's out on a work coup somewhere because he's, he's a big kid. He's At this time, he was 5'9", so you wouldn't think of him as a 13-year-old here. 
So he's still in FLDS, you believe? I, I believe so. Would you want him to reach out to you? I would really love it if he would reach out to me and uh, he has my number memorized and I haven't changed it for that reason. Okay, so maybe he sees this. I hope so. Or someone knows him. Yeah, thank you. Support no, thanks letters. for sharing this. <laughs> and I understand you don't want to be on camera. Totally understandable. I wouldn't either, to be yeah, honest. Not today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wish I could thank give you. her another big hug. The other three are with me. And I know, it makes so me emotional nice. every single time. It was Oof. so nice to meet all of these uh, people that were there and I just, oh, it's just, I can't imagine. I mean, mm. to, to fully put myself in their shoes to the point that your children are just missing and for years, I just, I just. <laughs> yeah, there's no words. Just hope they find them. Yeah. We're living over at the house that the Dream Center has been kind enough to dedicate um, in his name. The day that I left, I had the three with me, and then the next day I drove up to Sevier County, where, where his father lives, mm -hmm. to pick him up, uh, thinking that he would let me take him. <laughs> because, you know, I tried to explain to him that I, um, I was ready to make a different choice in life, and I, I felt a piece about it, and yeah. I was hoping that you know, maybe he'd understand that, you know, for, for my piece, I don't, I don't know why I thought that, why I thought that, mm -hmm. um, you know, because it's always important to find your piece, but it's more important to not be an apostate. So in becoming an apostate, then um, they believed that I was giving up the right to be his mother. Okay. So apostate is the bottom of the bottom. Yeah. Nothing worse? Nope. Nothing really worse than apostate. When she said that apostates are just the worst of the worst, I wish that people could understand what that actually entailed because it's not just that, okay, now they are these bad people. We're taught at a young age that if we ever leave the church and become apostates, and for those that have, uh -huh. they are immediately on Satan's ground and he has complete control over their lives. So for the kids in the FLDS that their mothers have left and the church is telling them, hey, your mother's an apostate now, that scares the child. The child no longer wants to be with their, with their parents if they left the church because the church is telling them that now these, they're these awful people and everything they tell you is a lie. So it's a very touchy, tricky situation. The mothers are in really big fear for their children right now. There's a okay. huge issue with the... Um, the running away of children. So a lot of women are in custody battles, just like the woman we were just talking to. And where, when they're in the custody of their father that is in the FLDS, he can basically get brownie points from Warren by bringing the children to compounds, bringing them. And then they just say, oh, they ran away while they were in my custody and the police can't do anything. Because with runaways, if they go beyond state lines, it's really hard to find runaways. So they're really sending them off to work camps, they're sending them off to compounds. And Warren Jeffs recently has revealed in certain revelations that he's like gathering, especially girls. We have a very good close source to Warren Jeffs who recently told us that it's mostly girls in some of these compounds that are getting ready for marriages. Obviously they don't care if it's an underage marriage and they're getting them ready for that to happen again and start having children again. So all these mothers are living in fear that anytime they go with their father, there's a possibility that they might not ever come home and that they'll run away and be married off under Warren Jeff's control. And so when they're on a compound, law enforcement needs a warrant warrant to get in there, right? Well, yeah, and they have to have some kind of proof. If it's a runaway, it's yeah. hard to prove that they're gonna be with somebody who has no relation to them because in their minds, Women and children are property of the priesthood, okay? So they're raised their whole lives, and Warren had used his control so many times to separate families and tell children, well, now this is your mom and dad because your mom and dad aren't worthy of you. So kids are used to being displaced. That's not weird for them. So when that happens again and they said, oh, now you're going to this priesthood head. He's your new priesthood head. This is your new family. The kids aren't putting up a fight. They're like, okay, I need to be with the priesthood holder. I don't want to live with my apostate parents. And so if a parent sends them somewhere like that, there's no way for the police to know because they're not blood related in any way. It's a church group, not a family member. Okay, and then with state lines here, it's pretty easy. Yep. Mm -hmm. We're right on the border. Yeah, yep. and there's a okay. lot going like into, um, it was North Dakota, 
there's, we know that there's a compound there. There had been groups previously in Texas where Warren Jeffs built the temple. Children were being stolen in the middle of the night from their mothers and being told, your child went to Zion. Five-year-old kids, literally the mom would wake up, where's my child? He's off in Zion yep. in Texas. And they had no idea, and, no way to contact them, nothing. And the mothers could do nothing about it. Mm -hmm. Because once again, like Melissa said, they are property of the priesthood, the, the, the church, in other words, the property of the church. The church owns them. They are completely owned by them because the prophet gave the man the wife, mm -hmm. and therefore any children, oh. any children within that family are also part of the church because it was all given to them by the church. It's awful to think about it that way, but ultimately that's kind of the idea behind it. Peter, so it's <laughs> Peter's space. Even like I think we just broke him at that point. I remember thinking back, and <laughs> he was like. What? <laughs> there were a couple moments. I'm like, when you get Peter Santinello to be speechless, um, that says a lot about the topic at hand, I think. Yeah, there were a couple moments. And, and like we talked about earlier, there this, you know, there's a short amount of the whole day that is actually on here that we just had great conversations. And man, I, I feel there were a few moments where we thought we were going to break him with, with trying to understand like the fact that this is going on today in America is just, it's just mind blowing to so many people that weren't raised in it. And I can imagine that other people are watching this and thinking, what in the world is going yeah. on here? Thinking the same thing. Yeah. It's a lot, we know, it's a lot, but it's, it's a big issue right now. And there's a lot of organizations yeah. trying to. It's a big issue right now. It's not going away, even though Warren Jeffs has been in prison for many years. Yeah, it became more of an issue, this idea of running away. Basically the church got smarter because as women had places like the Dream Center to go to, and they realized that they could leave and take their children, there started to be these custody battles. And the state of Utah in particular, they're, they're no stranger to the situation. They know what's going on. They know that the moms are trying to get away from this hide man religion. And so they were going through custody battles and trying to go through it the right way. And they were going with SWAT teams to literally forcibly remove children from other homes and give them back to the mothers. And it was a huge ruckus every time they were going out and because the people wouldn't just hand them over, you know, a mom would come with custody papers and be like, here you go. I need my children back. And they'd be like, no way. We're not giving them back. So they had to start using law enforcement and the FLDS realized, or the FLDS leaders realized, we don't want to deal with that mess. We don't want sheriffs. We don't want people coming in forcibly removing kids, but what happens if they just run away? If it's a runaway, we don't have to deal with law enforcement coming and trying to get them from us. Well said. Thanks, babe. Also, I what Gladys said was very interesting. Know. She really liked it. <laughs> you just barely noticed that. It's the first time I noticed that. I was trying so hard. <laughs> Peter and I were kind of like la like laughing at it, and while it was happening, so I'm glad in the edit it didn't look as bad as what it felt yeah, like. Because I, I was trying to talk like it was normal, and I didn't want to have to repeat myself. <laughs> it's driving me nuts. That's what we get for having our windows down near a dairy farm. <laughs> in many ways, only when her children were taken away did the alarm bells go off, and she got out. But in a way, which which was interesting, is she sort of misses the whole community of it. Right. Because yeah. you can see how lonely it would be. Yeah. Right. Once you leave that, was that was that the same for you? Yes. Well, when you leave, I mean, I imagine. Let's go get a snack. I imagine it's similar with any religion. Okay. Leaving a, a community, a religion is so tough because of that community aspect of it. It's just so hard to leave all of your friends and family behind, especially in a place like this where. You know, it's so easy to lose all of them if they know that right. you're no longer a part of that religion. Right. Hello, Hello. ma'am. I would say along with that, any high demand religion, because when you have a high demand religion, when a lot is demanded of you in so many aspects of your life and that demand is no longer there on you too, it creates this void in weird ways that you wouldn't necessarily expect. Yeah. So even not, I mean, the FLDS is an extreme example. Even when we left the LDS church, when things stop being demanded in your life, becomes a little bit less, I don't want to say chaotic, but like, okay, now we don't have to go do this. We don't have to do that. We don't have to do this. We don't have to do that. All of a sudden you have this void and you wonder, do I need to fill it with something else? Mm -hmm. Do I need to fill my time and my energy and all this focus onto something else? Or can I take a deep breath and not have that void, you know, and constantly battling with that void and, and how you're going to continue to move forward with your life and and the community aspect, even if you try to keep the community or in our case, like it's not like we lost 
friends and family by leaving the LDS, it did strain some relationships. We didn't necessarily lose family, but that sense of belonging and community and going to church and knowing where you're going to be. And yeah. I don't know. It's, it's a big, a lot. Yeah. It's a huge adjustment to make when that is such a huge part of your life. Exactly. Right? So that's, that's where you have to really think about, okay, how am I going to move forward from here now that all of that is in a way missing, right? Oh, yeah, so, for so sure. So it was just a big adjustment. Yeah, and the more they demand, the bigger the void, I think. Exactly. I remember coming to this store as a kid and always wanting to be old enough to buy a lighter, and they would keep telling me, no, so true. can't buy the lighter, you're not old enough. So it was dreams, dreams to be able they, to buy a lighter. They know what you would have done with a lighter you as a young boy. Probably started a big fire. <laughs> But <laughs> just just saying, the, the I was really young at this point, though, because by the time I was 12, I was reaching six feet. So it didn't take long before I looked like I was an adult, even though I was very young. But I just have to point out, I just love the way Peter goes about. I mean, he has his his camera and his little microphones, and he will go up to <laughs> anyone. I was like, man, I wish I could be more like that. I mean, he would... Just before this, he didn't really show it in here, but he was talking to a police officer, and I mean, he was just goes up to anyone, and and if they're willing to talk, then he'll talk to them. And so it's so cool to see, like he gets he gets information, and we'll see this a little bit far, further on when we go to the airport. But he gets information from people that normally wouldn't even talk, but because he isn't shy to ask a lot more people are willing to talk than you would think oh 100 and he's so kind and respectful and he right. doesn't do it in a way that seems like yeah. he's not trying to instigate anything right it's such like pure curiosity it was just it was a blast hanging out with yeah. him yeah yeah this is an overall video uh -huh. but really to get into it yeah <laughs> we're talking years no. of stories it right? would be it'd be a long time yeah. which you guys do have on your channel these guys have an awesome YouTube channel. That's how I found them. Oh, thank Growing you. Growing up in polygamy. Yes. And so if you want the deeper dives audience, you want, this is just sort of a teaser actually. Just <laughs> thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> we appreciate it. And I appreciate all of you who are here yes. from Peter's yes. channel that took him up on this and did come and check us out. So many of you have commented or emailed that you found us through Peter's channel. So thank you all for being here. This hill that we see ahead of us, when anyone refers to over the hill, this is the hill they're talking about because you're leaving Colorado City and you're going up over the hill into Centennial Park. And Centennial Park is a group of people that left the FLDS church when the prophet Roy Johnson, we call him Uncle Roy, when the prophet Roy Johnson died and the first Jeffs took power, which was Rulin Jeffs, a lot of people split off from the FLDS church and went over the hill and built their roots into a place called Santaniel Park. So we'll go up over the hill and just give you a glimpse of what that kind of looks like. And that's fundamentalist also. All, yep, they practice polygamy to this day, multiple wives. It's, it's still going on to this day, yes. Is it as extreme as FLDS? In some ways, yes. In other ways, no. I would say it's just as extreme before Warren came around. Uh, one of the things that they take pride in or say that they never do is underage marriages. They say that they always let the woman be at least 18 years old or the girl, and then they can decide if they're ready or not. What's FLDS's age? Do they have an age? There was no age. Uh, I had I had uh, people that I knew very well that got married as young as 14, 13 years old. And they were, in some cases, not only asked to, but forced to get married. Oof. And in a lot of cases, they were not the first wife. They were the second or the third or the 50th wife. And so, you know, those are the horrific things that you hear about that happen, to my knowledge, only in the FLDS church. If ever they came over to our side of the town, to the parks or the stores, we would pick them out because they dressed differently. They didn't really wear the, the prairie dresses. They'd still dress very modestly, mm -hmm. but 
in the eyes of someone that was used to seeing my sisters dressed in these pastel colored prairie dresses <laughs> that their dress was seemed very worldly to me but you know it was still very modest most of them still wear long sleeve blouses and then skirts or something like that but long skirts so and that has changed a little bit over the years but during the time that i lived there they were still very modest and I would say that they still, even now, even though they dress more quote unquote worldly, it still would be considered very modest to the world standards. Exactly. Sometimes they would let their hair hang down. Ooh, and so hair. we would pick them out and we were not very welcoming to them at all. And so I imagine they felt, uh, you know, that it was difficult to ever go into the town of Colorado City in Hilldale. We had come out with a girl recently and she was sharing with us a little bit about the community in general and she said that they all have a lot of big businesses and they sell um, mortgages like their mortgage Mortgages, it started with like a big mortgage company and now they're huge and she said an interesting fact here because I know we had talked about tithing in the different groups but she said in Centennial Park the norm for the church members is 10% but there is an elite group of priesthood holders that if you pay an extra 10% you get to be part of this elite group so you're paying 20% tithing but she said basically it's like a big club of successful businessmen and basically they group together and they help like if a guy is a younger guy and he's like I want to start a business I'll give 20% tithing to be a part of this group and these really successful businessmen help them be also become successful so almost everybody or all of the higher ups in the church here have beautiful homes finished homes a lot of property all that anyone else thinking pyramid scheme here <laughs> Give me 20% of your money. I'll help you be successful so that your 20% becomes a bigger 20%, right? (laughs) Anyone else? No, just me. Okay. The homes are just so big and beautiful. They're so pretty. So they're having a lot of kids. They're having a lot of kids, yes. And I know that they're having multiple wives, especially the leaders of the church. So it's not a requirement you have to have multiple wives, right? It depends on who you ask, to be honest. Some people believe that you have to have three wives to get into heaven. That's a common saying for whatever reason. I never was taught that as a young boy growing up, but a lot of polygamous groups for whatever reason, maybe it was one of the early day uh, Mormon leaders, must have said something because a lot of them believe that you have to have the at least The celestial three. kingdom, right? The celestial kingdom, highest. yep, the highest degree of glory in order to reach that and actually in to their belief system, become a God. They believe that you can actually become a God and have multiple wives and have your own children in the next life. It yep. looks a lot better off over yeah. here. Yes. You know, it's funny, my father wanted <laughs> to build a beautiful big house and finish it and make it this amazing place. The problem with anyone finishing and making a house beautiful is Warren could take it away the next day. They didn't actually own it, so... Who's their prophet? They don't really have prophets. They have a brotherhood. It's multiple men that come together as the leaders of the church. There is one that's kind of the the head of the brotherhood, but yeah, they don't believe in one prophet over here. They kind of changed all of that when they moved this way. Them moving over there, the idea of one man being the prophet was part of the reason that they didn't want to continue following the FLDS church because they didn't like that idea. They they thought that it was a better way to live if there was this brotherhood, as they called it, or that there was multiple people in charge, kind of like the, the quorum or something of the 12 apostles kind of idea, but not one man makes the final decisions and makes all of the, I guess, important decisions by himself. Yeah, coming from mainstream LDS, it is interesting to me that you have the FLDS who basically just have like the prophet and his kind of right and his counselors Mm -hmm. and that's it. And then you have the Centennial Park group that have more of like the quorum of the 12, but no prophet. Then you have the mainstream LDS that has both, right? So they kind of split off and took pieces of the mainstream LDS leadership positions, but each of them took their own piece. Yeah, and there's other people that talk about the fact that that, uh, even Joseph Smith didn't want to be called a prophet at first. Did he not want to be called prophet? Was it just president? Prophet, seer, and revelator? No? Uh, or he that... became the prophet, seer, and, Re- and revelator. Someone comment down below. I've heard from different sources that in the beginning, he didn't want to be referred to as the prophet. Oh, I need to look that up. That sounds like so, a fun deep dive for me. So many different opinions, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> so this religion out here is growing. 
It is, actually, yes. And this one is not like the FLDS where it's kind of falling apart. It is growing, not at a rapid rate, but there are some people that are actually converting, not just being born in it, but are actually converting. There are some men that kind of talk about their belief to other people outside of the community, and some of the people think it's a, uh, a good idea. I don't know if it's just for multiple wives or if they actually believe in the doctrine. I don't know. but So we're pretty far out in the desert. Where is this supply of wives coming from? Like, they're moving it. I totally thought that he was going to say, where's the supply of water when he of said water. we're in the desert? We're in the desert. So when he's like, where's the supply of wives? You can see me in the background, like, cackling. Because I was like, oh, I don't know. I just saw it going a in great, a different direction. It's a great question, though. And, like, how does that work? Most of them are being born into it. When each family has so many kids, they multiply very quickly. That's one of the leaders. I don't know or remember his name, but that's one of the leaders living so in that pretty. beautiful home. How does it feel, Sam, driving around these streets for you? It's mixed feelings because I look down on this community growing up in the FLDS. I look down upon them as apostates. So we didn't really come over here. I did drive around with my brothers on these streets on occasion more than anything to be rebellious and feel like we were doing something exciting in our lives. <laughs> you know, since we couldn't watch movies or listen to the music we wanted to listen to or play video games or really we couldn't do anything. Uh, I believe another leader lives here. So we would try to find anything to have an adventure, feel like we were doing something exciting. And, and one of those things was to drive on apostate streets. <laughs> We were always looking for the next opportunity to bring some excitement in our life. That was just kind of the way it was. We spent our days either working or trying to find something exciting to do, like building a bicycle or something like that outside of the home that, you know, as boys, we didn't really like to be in the home at all. There wasn't really anything exciting or fun for us to do inside the Nothing home. Nothing but chores. Nothing but chores. And a lot of the girls would take care of those chores. So we would primarily either go to work or try to be outside playing or finding something fun to do. So yes, this coming to the bad side over here in the Centennial Park area and cruising the streets to see what we could see, it was a little scary. I'm not going to lie. As a young boy, I didn't know what was going to happen. You know, these are apostates. <laughs> Who knows? I mean, in our minds, they were on Satan's ground. That's kind of what we were taught. They were on Satan's ground because they left the truth. And so as a young boy, you can understand that would be frightening, mm -hmm. but we would still kind of sneak out and, and do things <laughs> so to funny. see how, see how far we could get, you know, see how, see how close we could get to the edge. But believe it or not, this place has an airport. I don't know if it is much of an airport anymore. When I lived here, Rulin Jeffs, which is just funny because Rulin Jeffs was the prophet. He had an, air, an airplane, a private airplane that he would drive around or fly from either here to Salt Lake or here it's to Canada, jet. and he had a private pilot. And our entire lives, we were told that the devil controlled the air and the water. Therefore, we were not allowed to fly and we were not allowed to go on boats. And our prophet was flying because apparently he had power over the devil. I don't know, but it was, it was confusing. And I believe that was like an initial, like a uh, founding prophet, something or other, because we were always told that that's why missionaries weren't allowed to swim was because Satan controlled the waters. Um, yeah. I was never taught that Satan controlled the air, though. So that's that something that... that we were taught. And, uh, you know, the, the rules are fantastic and great, but the person making those rules only abides by the rules until it becomes inconvenient. Well, I always and remember thinking, oh, sorry. No, I just going to say, and it became inconvenient for Ruth and Jeffs to drive back and forth from Northern Utah to Southern Utah. And so I believe that is the reason he got his jet. I remember being pretty young. I want to say like 10 or 11, the first time someone told me that LDS missionaries couldn't go swimming because the devil controlled the waters. Mm. And I remember being like, if they can't, then like, why can I? Like if the devil controls the waters, like why can I go swimming and they can't? And it was like this idea that Satan only cared about drowning the missionaries for some reason. I remember thinking like it was super weird. I was like, I don't understand why, but like, I'll just I, go with it. I was too young to try to like yeah. ask too many questions. What I was told about that is the fact that Satan is working hard to destroy the work of God. And missionaries are full time out there mm -hmm. preaching the gospel and trying to spread the gospel and all of that. And so the idea was that Satan would work harder to try to harm them. Yeah. 
Yeah. And like I said, from a young age, I just didn't quite buy it all the way. I was like, mm. I think they just don't want them around girls in bikinis. <laughs> That's my guess. Probably fair. And there, the airport up here is where he would fly in and out of. And sometimes we would hear that he was coming into town and we would actually join together as a group to watch him fly into town in his jet. I, at this point, I had no idea if the airport was still going to be here. <laughs> yeah. This was exciting. It won. <laughs> The airport of the year. Look at that. I wonder what that means. Out of all of Arizona, too. Arizona airport of the year. Doing, we couldn't sir? believe it. Good. Airport Good. of the year, correct? Yeah. We saw that. What does that mean? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> you you work down sure. here. I'm actually just about to head out. Oh, you're really? flying out. Yeah. Oh, nice. you're a pilot? Yeah. Wow. Did you learn? My dad runs it. He, oh, we're your dad owns? We're both going. Oh, wow. Yeah. Are you from here? Yeah. I haven't been here for like 10 years. Oh, wow. Okay. Very often. Okay. So I just come in to have my plane worked on and stuff, but I actually don't live here now. I was just telling him the stories of back when we were kids. We'd come out and watch Rule and Jeff's flying in his jet. Yeah. Yeah, those were pretty cool good days. Good times, right? <laughs> Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. yeah. I was a little kid. Yeah. Did you grow up in Colorado City, Hillsdale, or out here? Colorado City. Okay. Yeah, you, no, you guys didn't know yeah. each other? I'm sure we saw each other I, around. I, I recognize him. Yeah. Okay. But we didn't do much, like maybe work crew or something. Right. Something so, most likely okay. we helped build the fans together around Warren's house or something yeah. like that. But yeah. what age were you when you left? Well, I got asked out. Okay. Type of deal, but I was uh, 22. That was 10 plus years ago. Okay. So you were around longer than I was. My dad still is, as far as I know. Your dad still is. Yeah. Oh, and like he, still... he's okay. You're not apostate in his eyes or any of that stuff. That's I don't even know what he really thinks. You know, <laughs> he's, he's chill. <laughs> okay. He's not like the rest of FLDS. Oh, good. So, yeah, he kind of has to get along with everybody out here. Yeah, it's tough, man. A lot of these fathers and mothers are in this tough spot where they're not really sure what they believe because Warren is saying these crazy things, and they're not sure if it's coming from him or someone else. And then they've got all of their children that have left that they're just like wanting a relationship, but it's just so tough. It's tough to it's know. It's a lot crazier oh, sorry. than that nowadays, though. Yeah. It's crazier than that now? Yeah. Really? I mean, I could, I could go into it, but I'm flying back to Tennessee today. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I'm getting out of here. I got to get going. Well, appreciate it, man. Two things. One, the fact that he said he was asked to leave. That was something that happened a lot more after, well... There was a group that happened before Sam left called the Lost Boys. Right. Um, a few years, not a whole, I mean, it wasn't a whole lot before you left, but where boys were starting to get kicked out for things. Sam left willingly on his own. And then kind of after Sam left is when there were really a lot of people being kicked out all the time for all sorts of random things. So him being asked to leave, it could have been for something as simple as he saw a movie. Right. You know, he could have been caught listening to Taylor Swift. <laughs> like, something like that. As simple as that. As yes. simple as that. So the idea of like him being kicked out, oh, he must have done something bad. No, not really. It it could have been the smallest thing. And so it's kind of crazy to see. And then also to hear that his family got to be able to still have some type of communication because they have to for their jobs and stuff is really awesome. Kind of like the same as the girl in the grocery store yeah. or not grocery store sorry the um the gas station, the gas station mm -hmm. saying that these parents are really caught in a tricky situation and it's true and we're hearing more and more thankfully that as things are getting even more strange and, and, War and warren has been in prison for so long now at this point that parents really are not even really sure in some cases what they're supposed to be doing and so we've heard more and more that some parents are continuing some kind of relationship with their children that have left. And so that's just amazing to hear. Yeah. So this is the famous meeting house. This is where we held all of our meetings before Warren Jeffs was put into prison. We had Sunday meetings here and we had Saturday morning meetings here. And <laughs> it's weird to see it now all boarded up and kind of gringy looking. This was an, an icon of the city. I mean, we would fill up the entire parking lot surrounding this. We would fill up overflow parking lots. I mean, this place was just covered with cars. Thousands of people walking in at the same time into these doors here to go to church. And we were told. So 
Sorry, I just wanted to point out when I mentioned thousands of people walking in, this wasn't a memory that I thought about at the time when I was sharing this with Peter, but came to me right now. Even as a younger teenager growing up out there, I was still pretty tall, almost the same height that I am right now. And I remember my parents, every time we'd walk in and out of these doors, they would say, just, just look for Sam. Everybody follow <laughs> Sam because you can see my head. Uh, you know, sticking up above most of the crowd at that time, even so. Just, That's still how I find you in crowds. Yeah. <laughs> we were just, uh, yeah, we were just at yeah. theme park recently, and whenever I get separated, I just look up, yeah, and then I can find. <laughs> I have a lot of taller uh, brothers and even some taller sisters as well, but I'm still, aside from my oldest brother, I'm the tallest out of the family. So he's six four. I skyscrapered case. over most of my family. Yeah, you skyscraper <laughs> over most people. <laughs> And you make me look so short. I feel like a tall girl at like five, seven and a half. Uh -huh. I'm taller than most girls. But then like even when we watch videos like this, I'm like, am I really that short? <laughs> I remember as a young teenager sitting in this meeting house where on just the other side of this building, the FBI rushed the doors to try to get Warren Jeffs. At the time, Warren Jeffs was not here. He was on the run elsewhere and they were trying to find him. So we were sitting there, I was sitting in a chair facing this way, just like this. And we were saying the, the opening or closing prayer, one of the prayers. We all had our hair, heads bowed, and all of a sudden we heard this commotion, shouting, man shouting in the door, and people rattling the door trying to get in because we had bodyguards by the doors to keep people they didn't want in out. And we all kind of looked up, and by the time we looked up, all of the important leaders of the church were gone. We looked up at the stand, they were gone. So it was the, the person praying, all the leaders were gone, and we're wow. all like, what is going on here? The rumor is they ran out. Sorry, I just want to point out, I mentioned bodyguards here, like nonchalantly, like, yeah, they were bodyguards, <laughs> no big deal. What, you know, and people might wonder, well, why did you need bodyguards if you didn't think you were doing anything wrong? Well, the leaders of the church, especially the prophet, in my time anyway, always had body, bodyguards. And... It wasn't because, I mean, I didn't think it was because they were doing anything wrong. I thought they had bodyguards because the outside world or the outsiders or even apostates would probably try to attack them or that Satan would try to harm them in some way. And so they had these spiritual, righteous bodyguards that had lots of muscle and <laughs> as well. And, and guns, I'm sure. And, and weapons, of course, to guard them. But when I was in it, I didn't even think twice about, oh, maybe they're doing something wrong. So just wanted to point that out. Yeah, and I also have to point out the fact that there's precedent for this as well because Joseph Smith had bodyguards himself. So Very true. having prophets need or have bodyguards is not a new thing to Mormonism in general. Yeah. Out these back doors here, jumped on four wheelers, four wheelers and headed down into the creek, the creek. And, and just took off and went, went and hit somewhere. Okay. So the FBI <laughs> didn't catch him. <laughs> yeah. but oh, they didn't catch him? They anyone. did not catch him. No, they got away at that time. Yep. So later on, obviously, Warren Jeffs is caught in Vegas. But at the time, they were still looking for him and uh, didn't get him. You were saying <laughs> something so interesting. That was fascinating. I was talking about this guy we saw today. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was saying, basically, do you think he had younger wives and then you dropped a bomb on me that was very interesting well it's just a good reminder that the people they get assigned their wives so the average guy yeah the leaders could be corrupt possibly asking for underage wives most of the men in the community they're assigned their wives and if the prophet says here's your new wife she's 14 are you going to look him in the eye and say well i don't want a 14 year old and he's going to look at you and say so you're questioning what god wants for you God told me that this 14 year old is meant to be your fourth wife. Are you telling me you don't trust God? And that's what these men are dealing with. And so who's going to question that authority in that sense? Like it's not you, the men. And if you question it, it's like bye bye house. Bye perhaps. bye other wives. What if I have three other wives and 20 other children and now I have to leave the community and leave all of my wives and all of my children because I wasn't willing to take on another wife or whoever you told me or if it's so not I never strict thought obedience. About it. It that way, the men could feel really trapped in this. 100%. The women can have situations where they are oppressed or in circumstances that there's abuse or these other things that can happen. But the men also 
can be victims as well. And I think we overlook that a lot. We don't think about the pressure that this man has to live perfectly. And if his family's not perfect, and if his wives aren't perfect, and if his children aren't perfect, if anything in his life and household isn't perfect, he can lose everything. He can lose his business. Um, I know that you talked to Sam before about the fact that everything is church owned, right? It's called the law of consecration. It's a fundamental Mormonism belief that the church should own everything. And the early Latter-day Saints actually tried it and failed at it and couldn't do it. And so the FLDS tried to do it. But when we say everything, like their businesses were signed over. So if a man's kicked out of the community, they could have a multi-million dollar business that's gone. Warren just takes it and all the profits. Their wives are gone. Their kids are gone. Their house is gone. Everything. So when the prophet says lot. you're marrying a 14 year old fourth wife. You say, okay. Well, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong. I don't no, know. <laughs> you're, you're correct. And it's not, it's not that Warren was, was just telling them this could happen to you. If you disobey me, I'll take away your stuff. No, he was doing it time and time again. So the men were living in a fear all the time that if I don't obey perfectly, this will happen to me and I'm gone. They know it will happen. They knew it would. They saw it all the time. He used people as examples. One of yeah. his very first big purges, he literally stood up at the pulpit one Sunday. I was sitting there in that meeting and he literally, over the pulpit, whole community in the audience, and he called out several men and told them, you're out because you disobeyed or you did something that God didn't want you to do and you're no longer welcome here. And they literally had to stand up right then walk out no goodbyes to their family you're out of here wives he, and children he just made happen. he made an example of a lot of people to put fear into the other members of the church i don't really even have anything to commentate about what we just barely said and but i still want to leave it in this reaction because if there's like one thing that we can one thing there's a couple moments in peter's video where i feel like the things that we said are things that we really want to be heard yeah. you know, out there in the world and let people fully understand. And I think the fact that the, the men are victims as well in these situations and that they're not all these greedy, evil men, that that might be the leadership of the church, but it's not all the men in the church is definitely one of them. Yeah. I mean, that was one of those moments where Peter was just like completely almost speechless. He was like, whoa, because a lot of people don't think about the fact that not only the women, but the, all of the followers of Warren Jeffs we're always in this state of fear that I have to be perfect. I have to be perfect. I have to be perfect. And I assume that some of the abuse that the parents would cause to their children was out of fear. If you're not perfect, I'm going to lose you. And so they were mm -hmm. so stressed out all the time. And the, the simplest things, if their child wasn't obeying them perfectly, would probably just flip a switch in them that would cause them to be maybe extremely angry or, or scared and, and do things they wish that now they hadn't done. But it was a just a very tense situation to be in. Yeah. Since I left, a lot of the really dangerous things are gone. The fun stuff. The fun stuff. The fun stuff. <laughs> Can you guys walk up next to this cottonwood yeah. here just to show the scale? I've never seen a cottonwood even half this size. <laughs> this Red is dirt. huge. Sam, how tall are you? I'm 6'4". Check this out. You see the speakers up there? Yep. So a lot of the trees have these speakers. And back when I was young, this was the park where we held all of the community events. When I was young, living out here was kind of fun. We had the Harvest Festival. We had different events that we would hold in the, this park here where the whole community would come together. And it was just a blast. We got to see friends. We got to see other people in the community and just had a great time. But someone could get on the speaker and say something and the entire park would hear it. Like, hey everybody, it's time for so-and-so to sing a part over here and, and we go watch somebody perform on the stage. And there was a lot of, you know, skits and performances that the community would put together and we would get to go watch that as a community. So you'd have fun. We had a lot of fun. When I was a kid, it was a good time. It really was. So this bridge, obviously, you can probably see underneath it, there are, it's very steep. There are train tracks that run around this park. There is a small train in that tunnel over there to the right. Okay. Unfortunately, that tunnel or that train is brand new. You know, when I lived here, there was a train that looked like it came from before trains were invented. <laughs> and we would always wonder how it worked, but it did. And that was kind of the charm is it was this old train. But now they built some bullet train <laughs> it goes a lot of fun, but it, this train track goes around the entire park. Another 
thing that this bridge leads to is the infamous, <laughs> famous, big slide, oh, yeah. big cottonwood slide. Look at so that. This is the bad boy right here. You know, it may just look like, oh wow, that's a big slide. But when I was four years old, <laughs> I mean, you may as well have me jump off the Empire State Building at this point. Sam, do you still have it in you? Oh, you know on. what? At this point, Once my for feet old might times. reach the bottom before I get started. <laughs> Even this ladder. I walk up this ladder like no big deal right now. Let me say, when you're a little kid, the fear of falling through that ladder <laughs> How is many real. times have you done this? Oh, gee, I have no idea. Hundreds, thousands. This is what it's all about. <laughs> <laughs> it's just smoother than it looks. It's actually kind of fun. Yeah, it is. Like a pro. Good times, and man. There's, there's a glimpse of the, of the crick and at the also, bottom of the slide there. Just so you all know, yes, we did make Peter go down the slide. True. We made him go we down. We made him go down once as well, so it may not was, have made it into I the was, cut. But. I was videoing him go down, <laughs> and obviously my videoing skills wasn't good enough to make it, but he did enjoy the slide. Yes. <laughs> Come here, it's all boarded up. The windows you can see were propped open. I remember as a young boy walking through there and they would have chili. They would be giving out chili. And we, over here they'd be cutting watermelons and giving slices of watermelon and, and breakfast and lunch. And you didn't pay for this. You walked into the park and you just, it was a free for all. It was a community event. You walked in, you just enjoyed everything. I stuffed myself full of carameled apples and everything I could possibly think of. So you're glad you grew up like this? Honestly, I wouldn't change it. I think really? it really, I think it really has defined who I am today. Yep. I will say I wouldn't want my children to live and grow up the way I did, just because I feel like the way that we have decided to raise our children is better. Yeah. But I learned a lot. I take the good things that I that I learned here, mm -hmm. and I apply that to our family now. I really do feel like I learned a lot of good values growing up in this small community. And you don't look down on the FLDS now? I don't look down on the FLDS people, no. No, I don't. I look down on what Warren Jeffs and some of the other leaders, and maybe even prophets before Warren Jeffs, did some things that I highly disagree with. Okay. But as far as the people, what they were trying to do, what they were trying to stand for, I don't look down on that at all, no. Okay. You guys are awesome. Thank you. Appreciate <laughs> You're awesome. it. awesome. Appreciate you. Uh and wow. that is how the cookie crumbles. <laughs> yes. Again, it was such an awesome experience. Peter is just as cool and sincere and chill as what he comes across in these videos. That's truly how he was the entire day with him. Just awesome guy. We were so grateful to get to be a part of his channel. We're grateful for all of you who have come from his channel and now come to our channel to support us. Yeah. Just, just was an amazing experience. It. I have to say, this video that he did with us, it put a different perspective and view on my experience. We, we sit here and we try to talk about what it was like for me growing up in polygamy and, and we have guests on that talk about their experiences. But when you have the visual with, you know, you have the visual with the stories, it is easier to picture in your mind, I hope and I think. So I feel like he did a great job capturing the beautiful scenery of that area and asking really great questions that really got me thinking and talking about aspects of my life that maybe I would have never thought of. Yep. So thank you so much, Peter. Thank you all for watching. We appreciate you and we can't wait to talk to you all soon. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you soon.